Good evening. How many of you have seen this talk before? Why are you here? <laughs> no, but seriously, I, we've had a good run, this talk and I, and uh, it's time to say goodbye now. And this is the, already the short version. I have a 45-minute version of this, so it's going to be really quick. This is going to be 120 slides, so uh, better get started. This is the last time I'm going to give this talk, I think, I hope, actually. <laughs> but it's not that bad. It's still fun. So um, I make apps for a living. And uh, you know these little uh, squares that go on your home screen if you have, an, have to have a smartphone? Uh, so um, I guess since I make apps, you could call me an app developer uh, or a designer slash developer. But I prefer this term, user interface typographer. Now, if you want to be the best at your job, just invent a new job title. That's the key to success. I, I managed to do this myself. Uh, look it up. I'm the only one still. <laughs> um, and uh, what it means is actually I just put text on buttons. Putting text on buttons is my job. And um, if I want to be more specific, then I say um, I make typography. You know, typography. What is this? What what is typography? Many people think it's type design. It's not. It's uh, actually shaping text. It's giving text an appropriate shape for the purpose, for uh, the content, for the audience. And um, why is it relevant for user interfaces? Look at this. Typography is relevant because text is everywhere. And you know the user interface is just text in most cases. And uh, look at this iPhone settings screen here. If we re remove all the text, then there's not much user interface left. So it's all in, in the text. Or uh, if you think Word 95 was hard to use, wait until I remove all the text. Now it's really hard to use. And um, <laughs> text has always been the most important ingredient in user interface design. And typography is uh, user interface design for text. And I think we could actually t call our little devices uh, text machines, because interacting with text is actually the most frequent thing we do with them. Um, of course, we also you know, watch videos and play games. But reading text, and not just reading text, also writing text and interacting with text uh, this is what we do mostly with these devices. And these days, many people don't always talk about too much about, uh, or at least a lot, about the using part of user interfaces and the using part of the text, but not so much about the shape and the legibility and the readability of the text itself. So um, even though text is at the core of the digital user experience, um, the typography often sucks. And um, I'm just going to give you a few random examples. I, I made them up so I don't have to shame anyone. Um, actually, I'm just shaming the typeface railway here. Don't ever use it. Um, bad font choice, hard to read. Uh, again, same font, just because I was lazy. Too light, too small, lines too long, or amateur typography in general. Um, let's look at one typographically failed website that is very, very dear to my heart. <laughs> Seen this before? Yeah, Wikipedia is great. I, I love Wikipedia. I'm not shaming Wikipedia. It's just this line length here. You know, it, these, uh, it's not a big screen, but still these are like, I don't know, it's a meter, a meter of line length. And it takes a really long time to go from there to back over here. And I mean, you, you notice this when you look at this as a designer. So anyway, um, since I don't like the Wikipedia website and I also don't really like the mobile website that much and I I used to read it. I still read it a lot on mobile devices. Um, I also didn't like the official app really much. So uh, what I really wanted to have was a nice little Wikipedia app. And so I imagined what it would be like to have this app. And then I made the app. And uh, it's called V for Wikipedia, like the letter V, because in German we pronounce it Wikipedia, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> And my goal was to create a Wikipedia reader app uh, with the best possible reading experience on all of these devices. This is actually old. There should be the new ones without the frame, uh, you know, <laughs> with a notch. Um, let me show you how it looks. Uh, when you open the app, you see what other people read on Wikipedia, the, the most popular articles. You can, of, of course, also search for stuff like, uh, let's say, search for Friedrich Schiller. Always nice to look for Friedrich Schiller because most of the images are 
public domain right now, so I don't get in trouble. Um, and yeah, you can you know look at the table of contents. You can navigate in the article. You can zoom in on, on images and close them again. But my, my favorite feature of the whole app is that you can actually read the text. It's not that, <laughs> not, not that widespread in uh, modern apps. So um, of course, good typography starts with a good typeface, and uh, especially if you make a long form reading app, uh, obviously. Um, but my app design process is quite different from things, how things are normally done uh, in app development. So the fonts I was going to use, the typefaces I was going to uh, design the app with, were one of the first things that, uh, that I decided on. You could say I have a typography-driven design process, uh, or even typography-driven development process, because everything happens in one person. Um, and every aspect of the app was uh, considered from the typographer's point of view and design and development happen at the same time. And you can imagine that this approach gives you a different uh, result than thinking about the typography in the end when you're almost done, like, oh, well, let's check Google Fonts if they have some free stuff that I can use in my app. No. This is exactly the opposite of how I work. And ever, ever since I released the app almost three years ago, I've constantly tweaked and improved the typographic details. For example, I've also added a much requested uh, night mode to read in the dark. And I know it sounds silly, but reading a bit of Wikipedia on your wrist can be quite handy once in a while. <laughs> As you can see on my wrist, it's uh, an Apple Watch, not. Um, but yeah, oh, it's on the video. No, it's a great uh, thing reading Wikipedia uh, on your wrist. It works quite well because it has a nearby mode and you can see what's around you, uh, what interesting places. So it does make a lot of sense. Whether you like the Apple Watch or not is a different topic. Anyway, um, the app ships with uh, 12 quality fonts for uh, styles of Diogenes for the reading text, four styles of commit for tables and UI controls, four styles of Camingo code for uh, code and stuff, uh, monospaced uh, things. And all of this goes into um, the typography. But a good combination of typefaces is actually just like buying some paint for your painting. If you have the fonts, it doesn't make you a good typographer and it doesn't make the typography, typography any good uh, if you don't know what you're doing. So, um, a good long form reading experience, uh, text reading experience, is the interplay of text size, horizontal rhythm, line length, and vertical rhythm. And let me walk you through this. So this is the finished design. No, of course not. This is unformatted text. No, it's also not true. It's not unformatted text. It's just badly formatted text. There's no unformatted text in the world. It always has a format. As soon as you can see it, you know it has some kind of form. Um, so let's choose a legible typeface here first for this reading text. Let's choose a, a serif font and then adjust the text size, the horizontal rhythm. In this case, it was uh, just adding a little bit of tracking, if you can see the difference here. A little, loosen it up a little bit. Careful with this, though. Uh, then the line length and the vertical rhythm, the line height. And if you've tweaked these four parameters, uh, the text is easy to read. You may want to add some hyphenation uh, in the browser, for example. And uh, that's it, nothing spectacular. Uh, normally it takes longer than the 10 seconds it took me here, but um, it's, it's nothing spectacular. It's been done for centuries, starting with this guy. This is Johannes Gutenberg, and people have experimented with this typography stuff and how reading works and how letter shapes work for 550 years or something. And uh, the interesting part is that this guy has produced better typography uh, than most of the digital stuff these days. And he was the first one to ever do this stuff. He invented typo typesetting, so, of course, I think, he also invented typography. And um, what he did centuries ago, what he designed centuries ago, looks better than high-tech stuff. Why, why is the digital stuff so much, much worse than this book that was printed 500 years ago? Well, the most common excuse is um, in digital design, I have no control over the content. Well, it's true, but it's not a good excuse. Because you, know, you can put a lot into a static mock-up and into a written design spec, and um, you know, it doesn't really work for digital because it, the, the typography depends on the content. Um, you have to put these typograf typographic requirements into code. Typographic <laughs> rules are just 
basically algorithms, they're rules, they're rules of how to treat text. And that's why you can just put them in the app's code and then you can make good typography in digital. Um, what do I mean by this? Let me give you an example of how this works in my app. Here's a fairly straightforward design problem. Could be a mock-up from Sketch. I have an article header with a little misaligned image because I didn't fake it. It's straight from Wikipedia. And um, then the article title, Windmill. Works quite well. Okay, I could now p hand this off to the developer and call it a day. But then, uh, in the development process, this article title pops up. List of windmills in Antwerp province. Now this looks bad. And of course, uh, you know, it can't be solved by making another sketch mockup for the second exception. Um, and uh, luckily there is code and we can design with code. And in this particular example, I noticed after a while that Wikipedia articles often follow a pattern that's, for example, list off in the beginning and something in parentheses in the end. And I can just make a rule and, uh, you know, have the typography arrange itself automatically uh, based on this rule. And um, I can use something very common in computer science. Everyone who has a computer science background has seen this before, regular expressions. Uh, the problem with regular expressions is that half of this actually isn't a regular expression. I'm animating between not a regular expression and a regular expression. So if you can see the difference, you probably have a computer science background. Um, it looks like the, a cat has uh, actually <laughs> written this, <laughs> but it does something. It, it, looks, it lo looks totally fake. It looks like the hacker code on TV shows, like someone hacks into the mainframe. But it's actually uh, quite straightforward. Let me show you in this example. Um, this is the uh, shortened version of the regex I used to treat, uh, to, to change the title treatment for article titles. Um, it's one of the many rules I have in there, I must say. Uh, it looks for, in the beginning, list of or lista de, because, I don't know, I felt like making an English-Spanish version here. Um, and it looks for something in parentheses in the end. And uh, what it does is it just matches the pattern in the text, and now I can tokenize the text and format each one of these components individually. And uh, instead of this, I can make it look like this, and that looks a lot nicer. And once I have this code, I, the design is just there to be applied to millions of other articles without me ever uh, you know, opening Sketch again. It's just being done automatically. And here's another example of how uh, algorithms can make editorial des decisions. Uh, you cannot really read this text there, right? I mean, you can guess that it's Weltzeit Ur Alexanderplatz, but um, it would be nice if it could pop out a little. So a lazy designer would just add a shadow and be done with it. But I'm, not, I'm, I'm lazy, but I'm not in this area. So I decided I need some code that extracts the colors from the image, and then the algorithm decides which color is best suited. And then I put this as a semi-transparent layer over the background, and then the text on top of it. And then you can read the text, because I ensure the contrast is always good enough. And um, nice thing about it is not only that it gives this article a lot of character to have this blue in the top, but also all the other articles, uh, the, the header color always depends on the image if there is one. Most people won't probably consciously notice this stuff, but the sum of these careful details is what makes the digital product great. And this is my most important message to you today. If you design for digital, um, you did, don't design for specific content. You design the algorithms that design the content. Another example is this. No designer would design it like this, but this is what you get when you center the image in the header without doing anything about it. So I noticed this after a while, and it was bothering me. And um, <laughs> so I did some, uh, I found out that there was a face tracking uh, API on the iPhone, a face detection API, sorry, where you can just find out where the face is and then uh, I can make sure that I scoot the image into the visible frame uh, where the face is. Also works for multiple faces, by the way. Um, now the app just uh, shifts all the heads down. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't want uh, my app to behave me medieval and chop off all the heads here, but instead make it look like this. So the design and uh, editorial decisions live in the code, and once it's defined, this can be applied to an infinite number of uh, articles.
there's also this map in the app. You can look at Wikipedia articles in your uh, nearby area. You can also change the location. Why am I showing you this? First, uh, to show it off, of course. But then secondly, also, because I want to point out some typographic details here. Not the capital S set, which f some people love and some people hate. But actually, the more important thing here, there is a reduced space between the number and the unit, of course. There's, I mean, why not? It's just one line of code. So why not just adjust this in all the articles? <laughs> But why doesn't this uh, get done more often in, in shipping products? Because probably m most of the time, this knowledge is not with the person who does the coding. So I think that's what's going to have to change. Um, typographers know all kinds of spaces. Typographers love all these spaces. And they all have a purpose and a Unicode. And you can use them, and you should use them. And um, this kind of stuff is actually what I'm obsessed about. Microtypography, that's what it's called. Like Stuff like using the correct spaces or um, or this. This is how it's not done. If you don't see a problem here, now listen very carefully, because this is the one thing I want you to take away today, please. These are not correct quotation marks. These are not co correct quotation marks, and this is not a correct quotation mark and not a correct apostrophe. This is all wrong, and it would never happen in printed newspapers, at least not from these major publishing houses. Here's some of the biggest ones in Germany, also don't really know how to fix this in their IT probably. So I consider it my mission to explain to my generation and the younger people uh, that these are not correct quotation marks. <laughs> these are correct quotation marks for English. You memorize this by, uh, sorry, memorize this by thinking of 6.99. In German the order is uh, the other way around, and that's why I memorize it. German is more complicated, so it's not 66.99, but 99.66. So it's just awkward, and the other way around. Anyway, um, <laughs> so this is what uh, this is what German looks like. This is what the nicer German variation looks like. Uh, the one on, on the upper right is what f uh, what they use in Finland. So for some reason, they only have two. Uh, closing quotes. In Poland, the middle right style is used, and the, in the lower right, uh, that's a Switzerland style that's also allowed in Germany. Um, and there are many more styles. And why th there are so many ni nice nuances, cultural differences. Uh, why would people only use these ugly things? Because they're on the keyboard, right? <laughs> this is also the same uh, for the apostrophe, by the way. It's always this. It's also not the other one. It's this one. And. Um, I think, my, in my theory, the reason for this is actually this. What we have here is just a fancy typewriter with a very fancy calculator attached to it. And the keyboard that we have, have here stems from you know, typewriters. And after that came the mainframe terminals. And now we're here. And we still have the same keyboard that people used to, to type this stuff. And of course, it made sense. Uh, to just have uh, the same one for opening and closing uh, a quote, because you didn't have much room. You, could, you had to save every valuable key. Like, for example, where is my one? Where's the one? <laughs> There's only this crazy B up here. It's a German typewriter. It's an SZ, of course. And uh, f there's also no zero. <laughs> and the way you had to type this on a typewriter was just use a lowercase l or an uppercase o. <laughs> Problem fixed, right? So <laughs> engineering driven decision that still makes bad, causes bad, bad typography these days. That's how I feel about uh, typewriter keyboard on my high tech computer. Let's look at Wikipedia. Of course, the style guide says you have to use the wrong quotes in the English Wikipedia for consistency. But of course, this is nothing I could ever ship in an app. So I fixed it. And as you may have, <laughs> as you may know now, I don't fix this stuff manually. An algorithm does it for me. And because I put so much time into making this algorithm, I also made a, a fancy logo for it. It's called Typographizer. <laughs> and uh, you could put it in your own app, so there's no excuse anymore. What it does is um, takes these quotation marks 
and then makes good quotation marks. <laughs> That's a non-technical explanation. <laughs> And you can put it in your own app because I uh, have put the whole thing on GitHub and um, you know, can make your hap uh, app happy. And it will use the correct localized quotes for the given language. So in this case, the most co uh, g uh, common German quotation style. And um, also for complex stuff like this is a headache if you want to do it. Uh, I, I already did all the work. You can just download it and use it. Uh, but to get from this to this, you just need one line of code. That's it. And it works on all Apple platforms, and it's very simple code, so you can probably port it to all other platforms tonight, if you're a computer scientist, unlike me. <laughs> Took me way longer. Um, <laughs> so, get it here, it's MIT, of course, so free, no strings. And there's no excuse anymore to do this. Some designers in the audience may now be asking themselves, do I need to learn programming? Maybe. It sounds interesting what this guy just said. Maybe you know this from experience. You design a beautiful button, developer comes back with this. <laughs> and then the developer says it's all there. It's blue, it's Arial, it has a shadow. What's your problem? <laughs> and then you can start arguing which is doesn't, you know, it's not a good idea. Uh, or you can just fix it in the code yourself. It's not even code, it's CSS in, if it's a web uh, thing. So it's, you know, it's not computer science stuff. It's stuff that any designer can learn. And um, it's not about just fixing other people's problems. That's, always, that's a very limited view of things. It's also about opening up a whole world of design possibilities in your own work. So for example, uh, I've made an isolated version of uh, the nearby map that I've just shown, and I've added these little illustrator style handles, so you can see it's just a Bezier curve. It's like an illustrator, but it's interactive, and there's no way I can imagine how to design something like this in Illustrator or Sketch or any other tool. This is something you can only design a pro in a prototype to have, have a nice curve there. Uh, with uh, variable uh, parameters uh, of the two points. And here's the secret formula. Um, of course, could make a prototype, but I'll get back to that in a minute. Look at the physics simulation I made here. A little fun with the images. Actually, the new version I've just released th this week looks different, but also nice. Um, or you see how the text hovers a little bit? Yeah. This is something, how would you design this in Sketch? How would you prototype this? Like print out two, a sheet of paper and some, some plastic uh, foil and then... Not possible. Or this one, my favorite. It's a particle system. It doesn't look the same every time. Uh, it, it's, it runs on the graphic card, on the, on the GPU. And all these little things are little bookmarks. Okay. So I design and develop stuff uh, simultaneously, and the ideas challenge me to come up, you know, to take advantage of the te technology, and the technology also informs heavily informs my design decisions, not in a bad way. And last but not least, you can do stuff um, that doesn't make any business sense at all. You can just decide you need a rotating about screen logo with your awards in the back. And also, if you tilt the phone a little, it reacts to, this, to the environment, uh, to, to how you tilt the phone, and the lighting and everything. Yeah. Um, but you, know, you can make this kind of stuff if you have the power of code as a designer. Now, you're probably also asking, isn't the prototype good enough? Yeah, but a high fidelity prototype is almost as much work as building the real thing. You probably need framer, you need some coding skills, so why not just learn how to do the real stuff? And I think it's also time to stop thinking of UI design as something isolated from development. So prototyping is nice, but how about we all just get involved in the development stuff and can talk at eye level and talk about how we solve problems without this barrier of communication between designer and developers. If developers just you know, learn a little bit of design, judging design, and designers learn a bit of talking about code and ter talking in technical terms, um, because, for example, typography happens on all of these stages. So design with code, because design, designing with code is inspiring, designing with code is necessary, 
uh, because of a lot of the design and the typography that makes or breaks the user interface lives in the code. Thank you. For legal reasons, obviously. Don't cut this from the video. Yeah, video, good good uh, starting point. If you want to see this very last version of this talk again, there's a Product Crunch uh, YouTube channel where you can watch it over and over and over again. Please. Only the part about the uh, apostrophes and the quotation marks. Yeah, yeah. Please. So we really need to bring this to the world. <laughs> that's, that's a mission. <laughs> and also your questions. If you have questions, they're also going to be on the video. But yeah. <laughs> Are they? Really? Yeah. Okay, then I'll be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was wondering, like, in terms of UX and UI, there are some cases when you can kind of check if it really works for user or not. But in terms of, in terms of typography, how do you understand that it's really more readable for user or if there is some more problems that you need to think of in terms of typography? Mm. Uh, so about um, the scientific side of legibility and readability, that's a huge discussion that's really, you know, opens up a whole world of controversy and, and me, me talking for hours. But no, uh, there's a good book on this, Shaping Text, uh, I can highly recommend. Um, no, is it? No, it's not shaping text. It's reading reading letters. It's the other one. Shaping text is good, but reading letters is for the hardcore nerds. You learn all the scientific stuff about reading, and um, how reading works. There are lots of different theories around it, but I think it always comes down to someone who has uh, an uh, you know an education in typography and who knows. I can I can look at something for a split second and tell you if it's legible or not. Probably. I'm not the only one, there are lots of people, but it's, it comes with the experience and it's, it's a craft and it's, you know, I, I'm not quite sure if I should agree with the art thing, but I, I think typography is definitely not always just, you, know, you can't just A-B test and say this is better than that. That's, you know, some, sometimes you, you want the text to give you a certain message on, uh, you know, on a subconscious level, and, and that's something that no A-B test can, can really put into numbers. So, yeah. Difficult topic. Uh, craft is the answer, and learning this stuff, learning your skills. Anyone disagree with this? <laughs> Let's start a discussion. Maybe you, I don't know. <laughs> I agree with everything that <laughs> was uh, wonderful. Um, uh, I just want to now. I just checked like it's six ninety nine euro for the app. So who's actually oh yeah, gonna buy the app? Yeah, Sorry. I will yeah. because you got me on that. Um, but who's actually gonna like buy it? Is it only designers or uh, do you um, have some information about that? Well, people people who are willing to pay for the user experience because I want to make very clear that I'm not re reselling the content of Wikipedia. That's not what I'm doing. I'm I'm selling a good user experience to experience the content. It's like selling or buying an iPhone for a better user experience for the internet. So, you know. So I'm, I was just going to ask, like, is it working? Like, it, do people buy it? Yeah. Yeah, I've been, I've been doing this for um, two and a half years now, and it has almost sustained my uh, whole pay for, okay, cool. for the, you cut this from the video, please. Um, <laughs> <laughs> people don't need to know that. But yeah, it's, okay. it's been good. It's, it's, you know, a one-time payment, and uh, I don't have any hidden agenda. I don't track people and stuff. So um, I only get what people pay up front one time, so it's not going to run forever because if everyone has it, I have no business model anymore. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that's al already becoming a problem. But um, yeah. And just a second question about mm -hmm. um, maybe about your past. Um, yeah. There's an app called Partly Cloudy, and yeah. uh, just reinstalled it, and it's not working anymore. Yeah, that's and true. That's actually where I first heard you, and it was actually great. Uh, it was a cool app. Thank but you. can you tell me anything about uh, why it's not working uh, anymore? Uh, the, first, a remark that's un unconnected to, to uh, what I'm about to answer your question. It was not designed by me, it was designed by my team, and I helped a little. So that was back when I did more agency work, and uh, my colleague Tim Kikeritz designed the app. Mostly together with Jana Kühl, just to make the uh, credits. Uh, also, I didn't build it even. Uh, Toby built it, Toby Ottenweller. There we go. Um, yeah, Party Cloudy died because um, this was like six years ago, 
and it just wasn't sustainable anymore. It was, you know, making weather apps is not something that you can do for decades or centuries. It's, it was also very 2012 fashion, and it costs a lot of money and effort to um, keep improving a product like this all the time. And I can only afford it right now. I'm, I'm putting a lot of time in it right, into it right now. I've, I've just uh, released a major update that took like four months full time uh, without getting anything extra. I could have just, you know, waited for the money and um, do nothing. And of course, I get a little spike from the publicity now, but it's, yeah, it's also a thing of passion right now. It's, so I have a product, it's doing well. People use it, that's also important. Um, the analytics t that Apple gives me, which is also uh, very pr privacy uh, conscious, uh, so I don't know who uses it. I just know that how many people use it of the people who have opted into sharing this data. Um, so, uh, but I know from that that it's worth doing it because people are using it, they're not just buying it. Yeah, thanks. Um, does accessibility play a role in your designs? Do you have and if so, are you guided by any principles, or um, can you share anything about uh, this? Accessibility in terms of voiceover, uh, like, is, um, yeah, it's, uh, it works fully with voiceover. I've put in uh, a lot of work to make this right, and I do have a few blind uh, users that I know of who have written me emails, and some have su uh, suggested, uh, you know, minor tweaks, and I've learned some stuff about, you know, that if you do iOS stuff and you do voiceover, th that's the stuff where you can, you know, y you should try it out, it's on everyone's iPhones. You turn it on, and you don't have to look at the screen anymore. Uh, it's really hard, but you can learn how to use it. I'm quite good with this now, um, <laughs> because uh, it was very, very annoying. It, uh, everything you touch gets spoken, so you can navigate the whole system by uh, just swiping around on the screen. And there are some, some power user stuff that I didn't know of. For example, there's a Z gesture, where you just go like this, in a Z, Z, Z gesture. And that's, that always gets you back to the last screen, and you have to implement it manually. And I didn't know this, and the app didn't have it until I learned it at a conference, and I built it in, now it's everywhere, and it seems to work well for... Uh, accessibility-wise for blind users. Frank, hi. Uh, this is the line of questions here. Hi. hi. <laughs> um, really interesting work um, and uh, a really lovely passion you have for typography and design. Uh, I have two questions, one comfortable and one slightly uncomfortable. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> one, uh, I will start with the comfortable one. Um, what is the logic behind uh, those uh, location articles? Uh, how does it work? You, uh, people that actually watch those articles, people that write them, you are able to see them? So um, it's very easy, actually. It's every Wikipedia article in the world, you can add a little geo coordinate to it, and that's it. As, as soon as you've done this, it will appear on the map with the, uh, if, if you're in the area or if you tap on, on the place that's within the area. And my uh, app just takes the seven closest ones on iPhone and the nine closest ones on iPad because there's just more space. Um, I just figured this out by, by trying out what works, you know, how many items make sense. What's the uh, uncomfortable question now? Um, judging from your passion for typography and uh, all your effort put into uh, 69 uh, piece of code, <laughs> which actually there too, um, why did you choose this logo? Uh, also, if we are looking into the okay. scene here, it's it looks like many other finance players. It's, it's a joke. Oh. Didn't you get the joke? <laughs> Open source projects always need a shit logo. <laughs> <laughs> it's very clear. My favorite one is Image Magic. Just look it up if you. If you can. Uh, anyway, so yeah, it's on. Pur it's cheesy on purpose. It's yeah, but you know, I could. If you have a better suggestion of something formal, I, I'll take it. But I think cheesy is just right for open source projects. Okay, that's good. But thanks enough. for the question. Anyway, it's a thanks good question. <laughs> Yeah, this is all right. You and then maybe someone from the front again. So I don't want to miss out on you. But um, did anyone from Wiki uh, reach you? Um, yeah, I talked to someone from. 
actually Wikimedia, the guys, uh, guys and girls who make um, the Wikidata project, they're in Berlin and they're really nice. We went to their office a couple of years ago and uh, it was really nice discussion with them. And also I talked to some other people, I'm not saying any names because it's on video. Um, and they also said, yeah, we know that it's not great and we can't change it because, you know, and I know this even from my past in working in, a, in an agency or in, on bigger, larger scale products, if you have many users, you have to be very, very careful um, of just changing stuff around. And even they even tried limiting the line length, I think back in 2012 or something, also, or 11, or even earlier than that, because everyone knows it's not good, it's not comfortable to read. And, uh, but they can't change it because people resist this change and people with the say in the community. So, um, yeah, I, I still think they do great work at the design team at Wikipedia, given all the constraints. I wouldn't be able to work in this uh, kind of setting, I think. So, props to them. All right, other questions? Um, two questions. Uh, one, are, um, do you have plans to make it for Android? Hey, I won the bet. <laughs> I s uh, really? <laughs> um, no, because, because I don't believe in cross-platform uh, applications at least not if you want to go for this level of sophistication. It's just there are too many things that are platform specific that you cannot make an app that looks and works and feels right on both platforms with one code base and I'm not willing to make an extra Android app just, you know, because it's not my platform and I, honestly, I, it would take me another two years to learn it and I don't want to do it, so why would I? Fair point. But yeah, if anyone uh, wants to partner up and make uh, exactly this for Android, um, I am an Android developer. <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question is: yeah. um, Do you think about uh, other languages or non-Latin typography? Uh, yeah, I have a special treatment for um, Korean, Japanese, and Chinese. I talked to people who are experts in these uh, in typography for these languages and I made some special adjustments. I also have uh, Cyrillic and Greek adjustments. I also, of course, support right to left, but unfortunately not in all the menus, uh, just limited to the articles and, you know, to the reading stuff, uh, um, to the essential, most essential stuff. And, uh, yeah, I try to make sure that it also looks good in the uh, Native American uh, languages that only have 100 people who can read it, but it, you can still read it with this app. It works. You can, by the way, uh, it's localized in four languages that all the menus are um, localized. Uh, English, uh, German, obviously, uh, French, and Spanish. But you can, of course, read all the Wikipedias in the world with this app. So everything that the character set supports. <laughs> Thank okay. I think uh, I'm over time now. Any other? I'm way over time. That's fine. We'll see if there's other questions. I mean, we had this bet, you know, he told me uh, beforehand that like, anytime someone asks, is there an Android version? And Ahmed, yeah. now you ask. It's a, it's a good question. <laughs> it's, it's a good question. Definitely yeah, it's is. It's a good question. And but he may, might even be able yeah, to help so you with it. Of course. But yeah, you know, one person can't really do both platforms great. I've never seen it. All right, is there more questions? I'll go with uh, Joram first. Um, I would like to know whether you have successfully persuaded someone who just doesn't care about microtypography at all because he or she is not a designer um, and made him or her make up a budget for that. Uh, no. <laughs> no. um, but I, but I, 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 I'm very proud of one project we did with the OECD, uh, that's a big organization, uh, used to be a client of ours, and we um, managed to convince them to um, exchange their corporate typeface for uh, one that's easier to read when we did redesign the data portal for them. Um, because you know Helvetica just doesn't work in small sizes on screen back then, even on and pixelated screens, even worse. So uh, yeah, we we didn't manage to uh, convince them. So it, it, uh, yeah, 
intelligent people will always listen to your arguments about it. Uh, and uh, yeah, th this turned out well. But I've, I've seen other cases where you know you have to fight, and I'm now. I actually prefer working on my own products, uh, also for the reason that, that I can, you know, put in spinning 3D logos in my about screen without anyone asking me why. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody would probably uh, give me a budget for that. So um, we can also talk afterwards if you want. Yeah. Thanks so much yeah. for saying this, because that's thanks. what I was just about to say. Thanks.